the purpose of this video is to go over all of the labs that we either completed in AP Chemistry, that we did in Honors Chemistry, or potentially that you're expected to know that we didn't do in class, but that are simple enough um, that we're not going to actually complete them in class itself. All right. So the first lab that we ever completed was separation of a dye mixture using chromatography. Okay? And we specifically used paper chromatography. Okay? So a couple of quick terms that we need to go over. So what we did was we took chromatography paper and we spotted it with our ink. Okay? Our chromatography paper is going to be our adsorbent because it's our solid phase. We then took that paper that was spotted with our ink and we placed it into, the very bottom of it, we placed it into a solution. Um, in this example that you see on here, you have water. Um, we used ethanol, okay? So that liquid that's gonna help to separate out the specific dyes, that is called your elulent, okay? So what is the purpose of chromatography? The purpose of chromatography is to separate out your different dyes based on differences in polarity. Now, the important thing to note is that the distance that travels depends on polarity. So in this example and in the example that we used with ethanol in our lab, the elulent, water, and ethanol are both polar, which means that the dye that travels the farthest is going to be the most polar because the dye can form either hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole forces at the very least with the water or the ethanol, okay? And therefore, it's gonna be more attracted to the water, so it's gonna travel farther with the water or with the ethanol, in the case of our lab. In, if your elulent is polar, then that means that the dye that is most nonpolar is gonna travel the shortest distance. So if you notice here on this chromatography paper, the purple would be the most nonpolar, while the yellow would be the most polar. That being said, you've gotta be careful to make sure you know the polarity of the elulent. Because if your elulent is nonpolar, then the most nonpolar dye would travel the farthest because it would be the most attracted to your elulent. Okay, so you gotta be careful when you're looking at chromatography, don't just assume that the most polar dye travels the farthest. Because if you don't have a polar elulent like we do here and that like we did in our lab, if your elulent is nonpolar, then the most nonpolar dye would travel the farthest and your most polar dye would travel the least farthest. So just be careful with that. The other thing I needed to talk about was the RF value. In your lab, you calculated the RF value. The reason why you need to calculate an RF value is because we don't want to be forced to allow our chromatography to run for a very specific amount of time. We don't want to always run it for five minutes. What if we want to let it run for seven or for 10? The issue is we can't compare the distances traveled by the dyes if the run times are different. But we can if we use the RF value because your RF value takes the distance traveled by the dye and you divide that by the distance traveled by your elulent. And that value is going to be consistent regardless of how long you allow your chromatography to run, right? So if you run it for five minutes versus 10 minutes, it's going to be the same RF value. So it's kind of a standard. It lets you compare um, and, and complete multiple labs for a specific or experiments for a specific dye, but not having to be consistent with the run time. Okay? All right, let's look at the next lab, qualitative analysis of molecules. So in this lab, we used specific qualitative characteristics of different types of molecules in order to identify unknown substances. So I'm going to go through these and add a little bit of commentary as I go along. So how do I identify that a compound is ionic? First of all, ionic compounds will, for the most part, dissolve in water. Some of them are not great at dissolving in water, but they all, to some degree, will dissolve at least a little bit in water. They do not conduct electricity as a solid because their ions are held tightly together. They do conduct electricity when they are dissolved and form aqueous solutions, and that's because their ions are free to move around. So that's a great way to tell if a substance is ionic. If it doesn't conduct electricity as a solid, but it does when it's dissolved in water, it's ionic. No other compound does that. Okay? It has a very high melting point. Okay? In order to melt an ionic compound, you have to break apart a positively and negatively charged ion. You have to actually break them apart in order for them to become liquid. That lattice energy, lattice energy is simply the attraction between the positive and the negative charge of those ionic compounds, is really high. So I've never seen an ionic compound melted before. It would require a lot of heat. 
One last thing that I wanted to note, you might be asked to actually uh, show the diagram for what happens when an ionic compound dissolves in water. So I wanted to show you an example here. So here I've got sodium ions and chloride ions. And when they dissolve in water, what happens is that we say that they are solvated, meaning they are going to be surrounded by water. Now notice, for a water molecule, you've got the oxygen in red and two hydrogens in blue. Oxygen, because it's more electronegative, is going to have a partial negative charge while hydrogen is going to have a partial positive charge, right? Because oxygen is hogging the electrons towards it. Which means that when sodium chloride breaks apart and dissolves in water, the water is going to surround chloride, but the hydrogens are going to be facing the chloride since hydrogen is positive and chloride is negatively charged. While for sodium, since it's positively charged, the negatively charged oxygen is going to be facing towards it. So just make sure you're comfortable with drawing that because you might be asked and it's just easy points to know how to do that. All right, a metal. Metals do not dissolve in water. Think about aluminum foil. You can put it in water, it's not gonna dissolve, okay? It's shiny, it's ductile, which means you can actually stretch it out into wire, and it's malleable, meaning you can pound it out, okay? Pretty easy to identify a metal based on this, but let's go a little bit further. Me metals are the only compound that conduct electricity as solids, okay? And if you want to go back and look at why exactly they conduct electricity as solids, you can go back to the semiconductor reading that talked about valence versus conduction bands that we read. However, you simply need to be able to note that they have a sea of mobile electrons, right? And that is why they conduct electricity as a solid. Metals also have a fairly high melting point. It's not super high, like ionic or um, covalent network solids, but it is still pretty high. But you in your lifetime, you can see melted metal. It just requires a good amount of heat. All right, next compound, a polar covalent compound. So a polar covalent compound, um, remember it's two, at least two nonmetals that are covalently bound together. Um, if they're polar, that means that their dipoles do not cancel out. And as a result, they are able to dissolve in water because they can form dipole-dipole forces or hydrogen bonding with water, depending on what molecule you have, okay? So remember, don't just say like dissolves like. We need to say that polar compounds can form dipole-dipole forces or hydrogen bonding, depending on the molecule, with water. Polar com compounds cannot conduct electricity ever because their electrons are stuck in covalent bonds, okay? And they have a fairly low melting point. Now, I'm going to bring up a really quick term. They have a low melting point and a low boiling point, which we've already talked about, which means that they have a high vapor pressure. Well, what does that mean? The vapor pressure simply is a measure of the amount of that compound that has become a gas. So if you have a low melting point, that means that you're going to have more molecules going from a liquid to a gas, which means you're going to have more gas molecules, which means you're going to have a higher vapor pressure. All right, a nonpolar covalent compound does not dissolve in water, okay, for the most part, poorly dissolves in water, and that's because it can only form London dispersion forces with water, which are much weaker um, than the dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding that polar covalent compounds can form with water, okay? They cannot conduct electricity, same as with polar covalent, because their electrons are stuck in covalent bonds, and they have an even lower melting point, which means they have a very, very, very high vapor pressure. Most nonpolar covalent compounds, unless they're really large, and have strong LDF forces, they're normally gases at room temperature, okay? Finally, covalent network solid. So when I'm talking about a covalent network solid, I'm talking about carbon in the form, it can either be diamond or graphite, or uh, quartz, silicon dioxide, okay? They cannot conduct electricity. Remember, the exception is graphite because graphite has loose electrons because it's in sheets. Um, and that's because the electrons are stuck in covalent bonds. And it has a very high melting point, like very, very high melting point. You will never in your lifetime see melted diamond. Okay? So those are all the characteristics of compounds and how to identify them. We then went in the lab and used specific techniques like seeing if it conduct electricity in water, um, seeing the melting point, et cetera, and the boiling point in order to identify unknowns. All right, gravimetric analysis. We did not actually complete this in AP Chemistry. We did this in Honors Chemistry. So in gravimetric analysis, what you do is you allow a precipitation reaction to occur. That's a double replacement reaction, okay? A precipitate is going to form, 
and then you can actually filter out. So we pour it from the beaker into a filter and we can collect the precipitate. The cool thing with this is we can then measure the mass of that precipitate in order to go backwards and determine anything that we want. Once we know the amount of product that's formed, we can do any calculation that's required. Now, the important thing for you to know, you not only, if it's a double replacement reaction, you're going to have a precipitate that forms, right? But then you're also going to have spectator ions. So in gravimetric analysis, we're going to collect the precipitate. We'll find its mass. But there are a couple of important things that we have to do. First of all, we have to wash off the precipitate. The reason why we have to wash off the precipitate is because otherwise we're going to have spectator ions that are stuck to our precipitate, which would cause the mass of our precipitate to be too high. So we're going to wash it off with water in order to get rid of the spectator ions so that they can flow into the waste receptacle. The other thing we have to do to our precipitate is we have to dry it. We have to either put it in an oven or we have to leave it overnight in order to get rid of water. Because if water is left over, that's going to cause us to assume that we have more precipitate than we actually do because the mass will be higher. So for both of these things, right, washing the precipitate and letting it dry, if we don't do them properly, the mass of the precipitate is going to be too high. Okay. All right, how, when do we use gravimetric analysis other than when we're being told to? Well, if we have ions in solution and we want to know how much we have, what you can actually do, or if you want to separate out, if you want to separate out ions, what you can do is you can add an ion. So if you have cations in solution, you can add an anion that you know will form a precipitate with one of those ions. Once a precipitate's form, you can filter it out, collect it, wash it, dry it, and measure the mass. And then using stoichiometry, you can go back to determine how much of that ion you started off with. Okay? So gravimetric analysis is great because it lets us take something that's in solution, isolate it out, collect it, measure it, and then go back using stoichiometry to determine how much we have left over. All right. Well, what if we're not able to to create a solid. What if we're creating a gas? And so in our collecting a gas over water lab, what we did was we heated up a substance, okay, and I'm going to just talk generalities, not specifically what we did in our lab, okay. So you can heat up a substance or allow a substance to react, and whatever gas is collected, if you notice, it's being collected in this beaker here. This beaker was filled with water, okay, and we could use a beaker, ideally not because beakers aren't great for measuring volume, you could use graduated cylinder or a udiometer. Um, you collect the gas, okay? Um, that tool, whatever you decide to use, will be filled with water. And then as the gas is being produced, it's collected in that container and so it displaces the water. Okay? Therefore, you can determine the volume of gas that was produced and that's one of the hardest things to be able to do. So we're going to be using our ideal gas law Right? So we can actually determine the volume of gas that is produced by collecting it over water, allowing the gas to displace the water and therefore measure the volume of gas that's produced. The other thing we have to determine is the pressure of the gas within this container. So remember, once the water levels are equal, remember that the uh, total pressure um, within the beaker is going to be the same as the atmospheric pressure. Also keep in mind, it's not just the gas that's present there, you also have water vapor. So to determine the pressure of just the gas in order to use the ideal gas law, I'm going to have to use Dalton's law of partial pressures and correct for the partial pressure of the water vapor. So I'm going to take the atmospheric pressure, which I can find online, and subtract from that the partial pressure of the water vapor, which you can find out by just finding the temperature and looking it up online, right? What would the water vapor pressure be at that specific temperature? And so just like with gravimetric analysis where I could determine the mass of my precipitate that formed and therefore go back and do any sort of stoichiometry that I want to, here now I've determined the number of moles of gas that were produced because I know the pressure, I now know the volume, I have my R and I have my temperature. Okay. And so unlike gravimetric analysis where I'm actually collecting a solid, here I'm collecting a gas, but again I can still determine how much was produced and therefore use any stoichiometry that is necessary. So the very last technique that I'm going to talk about that we haven't done and we're not going to do in lab is distillation. Now in distillation, you have two liquids and you are actually going to separate them out based on a difference in boiling point. So in this container on the left hand side under the Bunsen burner, you have two liquids. 
one of those liquids has a lower boiling point than the other. And so what's going to happen is it's going to boil before the other liquid boils. And therefore, it's going to, the gas, the gas is going to move up and go through this distillation tube. Okay, so let's say, for example, I have uh, water and ethanol. Ethanol is going to boil before water would, so the ethanol would travel through this distillation tube as a gas, and then within this tube, I have cold water, and the purpose of the cold water is to actually turn that gas back into a liquid, and so that liquid is going to be collected in this flask, okay, um, and therefore, it's going to be called the distillate, okay, so Going back, I have two liquids. One's going to boil faster, so it's going to turn into a gas. It's going to go through this uh, cooling tube. The cooling tube is actually going to create, um, cause it to become a liquid again. Then it's going to be collected in this flask. It's the distillate. So the distillate is the one with the lower boiling point. Okay? And so that's the whole purpose of this technique, is to um, separate out two solutions or two liquids based on the difference in boiling points. So just as a quick review, these are all the labs that you guys are responsible for knowing about from Big Idea 1 and 2. So the first one, separation of a dye mixture using chromatography. So in paper chromatography, remember we're separating out solutions based on a difference in polarity. So if your eluent is polar, then the most polar dye is going to travel the farthest. If your eluent is nonpolar, then your most nonpolar eluent is going to travel the farthest. In qualitative analysis of molecules, we're talking about the different characteristics of qualitative characteristics of ionic compounds, um, polar covalent, nonpolar covalent, and metallic, in addition to briefly touching on network covalent solids as well. In gravimetric analysis, we are taking two solutions, allowing a precipitation reaction to occur, collecting that precipitate, and then being able to calculate, um, determine the, the mass of it by weighing it and then um, being able to complete whatever stoichiometry we want for it. Collecting a gas over, the wa over water is almost identical to gravimetric analysis in the sense that we're calculating how much product is formed. However, we're going to be using the ideal gas law and Dalton's law of partial pressures in order to calculate the number of moles of gas that are produced. And finally, in distillation, you are separating out two liquids based on a difference in boiling point, right? So the liquid that has the lower boiling point is going to be your distillate because we are isolating that from the other liquid turning it by turning it into a gas back into a liquid and then collecting it in a flask.